Delegate Mike Height joins us now via telephone from the Capitol. Good morning, Mike. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. And I know as a delegate, you probably had more experience with DHHR than most just because of your work and uh, dealing with IDD waivers and such. Mike, are you satisfied at this point with the reorganization of DHHR during this session? Uh, I am. Um, I think we worked hard on doing a split and doing it in a way that was going to... um, you know, be done in a way that it wouldn't disrupt uh, the services of DHHR. Um, And I think we've come to a a good conclusion. This was a bipartisan effort and and an effort that I think the uh, the Senate, the House, and the governor's office all worked on together. Lane Deal was on in the last segment and gave us a a very good overview of uh, the Child Protective Services Uh, segment of DHHR, what some of the main issues are, and perhaps uh, what some of the solutions uh, could be moving forward. And one of the things we discussed was a lack of some of the facilities that are needed in the state for the more complex issues and parents who have uh, children who become violent, uh, a danger to other people in the house, siblings and such. And as you go further down the rabbit hole, you start to run out of options in West Virginia for care for these children who have been traumatized in their youth and are are now, unfortunately, a danger to those around them. So you oftentimes have to leave the state. Will this reorganization begin to touch on solving problems like that, Mike? Uh, I believe it will. And and I think that that kind of uh, situation was being looked at even before the reorganization. I know there were some delegates down here that talked about going over and visiting a facility, I believe in Ohio, that um, that sort of uh, dealt with that kind of situation, a, a home um, that dealt with the, the more violent and, um, you know, more troubled uh, youth, and not just youth, but uh, all individuals um, that, that probably should not be in a state mental institution um, or in jail, um, and you need some kind of... Um, some, some, something that is in between that. And um, so they're looking at doing one of those here in, in the state of West Virginia, and that was even uh, before their reorganization. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get a facility like that in West Virginia uh, sometime soon. Mike Hyde is our guest, delegate of the 92nd, assistant majority whip. He also serves on committees uh, such as health and human resources, senior children and family issues, finance, political subdivisions, technology and infrastructure as well. And it is his expertise on the health and human resources committee uh, that we are drawing upon this morning. Matt Miller. Mike, was it... Mike, was it, it hard to give uh, the, the maybe due attention that, that the DHHR split needed when there are so many other things going on, or do you believe that you know you, you guys were able to kind of tackle it the way that you wanted to, or are there still some things that you were going, I, I wish would have been in this, this legislation? Well, no, Matt, I think the DHHR split was something that was a long time coming. This is something that has been worked on, um, not just in this session, but... Uh, in the off season and, and maybe even for a couple of years, um, I think they they tried they ran this uh, last year and it got through both houses and then was vetoed by the governor who felt like uh, we needed to have a study and um, b- before he felt comfortable signing a bill like this and uh, I think they did that uh, in, through the interims in the off season and. Um, There was a a McChrystal report that came out and gave a lot of information, and I think that's what they were going off of. So once that came back, um, like I said, I think there was a lot of of the legwork that was done before session. So by the time we got here, um, you know, there was a bipartisan effort, and even House to House, the Senate to the House, um, there was an effort to make this happen, and a lot of the negotiations had already been done before it got to us. Does this bill give some specifics to the leaders now with the split, you know, of things that they need to implement or do, or does it mostly create the split and allow those in the leadership positions to get together with those within their particular section and determine, hey, this is how we can move forward from here? 
Yeah, I think, Matt, I think it's the latter. I think that it, it just um, eliminates that, that sort of middleman, that hierarchy, so you don't have as many rungs on the ladder uh, to get things accomplished. So that, uh, you know, there's a cabinet level secretary, and then you're going down to the, the individuals, the uh, commissioners or whatever, the actual, the ones that are actually getting something done. Um, so I'm hoping that it will make things more efficient um, in those areas and, and they can focus on getting their job done instead of all the, uh, the minutia that goes along with this. I know Lane Deal also brought up a, a concern that, that while it's a good start, it could go one of two ways. And, and one is that, you know, there is a focus solely on now your particular section um, creating that silo, so to speak, um, that, that maybe there's not the interconnection. Are there elements of this bill that are, are making sure that, you know, you don't get so ingrained in, in, say, your portion of DHHR that you're not communicating to other services that still need to be a part of what you're doing um, so, uh, she's right that could happen but I think they are so intertwined already that there's still going to be um, you know some interaction between the, the two agencies now or even three agencies now um, to make sure that if they need something they know how to get in touch with uh, the other the other agencies to get services um, and, and they shared like administrative services. So I don't think that's going to be a problem, um, but you never know. Um, but my hope is it isn't, and that uh, these efficiencies will help everybody. Is there an idea that this is going to take a certain amount of time to really see how successful this piece of legislation is? Will it take a year, two, five? Oh, absolutely. I think. Um, to get a, a real clear picture on how well this has worked will probably be a, a four or five year period before you can look back and say, um, yes, this was good and look at all the good things that are happening now, or we still need to tweak a few things uh, here and there to make it even better. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Delegate Height. Um, good morning, Matt. Good, is there... I, and I know, probably know the answer to this question, but will any federal dollars be lost due to this split? No, I don't think so. Um, that's one of the things <laughs> they're really cognizant of down here. They they <laughs> focus on spending as much of the federal dollars that are available. And you'll see um, this time of year, there's a lot of uh, – uh, what they call back of the budget supplemental appropriations um, to make sure that we are capturing as many federal dollars as possible. So I don't think that that's going to be an issue at all. We are going to get every penny we can out of the feds. So it's my understanding that that the the three way split, and then there will be what I'm going to call like a central office that will handle um, administrative duties for the three branches is that correct yeah that's correct um, the administrative duties you know like like payroll human resources uh, purchasing those types of things that um, that can be consolidated for even uh, better efficiencies so who will be in charge of that office well they they have like a position that um, I don't even know what to call it. It's sort of a, a an odd position. I don't think it's a secretary level position. It's just a. I don't even know what to call it. There's just somebody that oversees that that position, but and they answer directly to, um, to the governor. Is there a search to fill that position, Mike, or does it already exist within? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that either. Um, I. I I think they were trying to hire within as m much as they could with these positions, um, especially the secretarial level positions. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, so right now you had in DHHR, you had uh, Secretary Coben, who was the interim secretary. Um, I don't think that he wants this position long term. He was somebody who was coming in, just wanted to help get us through this transition. Um, so it looks to me like there's going to be three 
secretary level positions that are going to open up within those three um, different agencies now. Um, they could hire within, they could hire, I mean, they could do a, a search and, and find somebody as well. I, I don't know uh, how they're going to handle that, so we'll just have to wait and see. There were some complaints about DHHR as being too big, inefficient, redundancy or duplication of services. Uh, programs being in areas of DHHR which did not make logical sense. Has all that been addressed, and do you think it's all been cleaned up? Um, I think so. Uh, they, they, they looked at a lot of those different things and, and, you know, wondering why one was over another. So you have, like, as an example, OFLAC. OFLAC is the, um, the agency that's, like, the oversight of, uh, like, hospitals and agencies and stuff. They go in and do the, the inspections and so on and so forth. And to have your, your facilities and your inspection agent um, under the same secretary was sort of odd because if there was uh, an instance where OFLAC um, had to come in and, and bring charges, then it would have been, you know, Secretary Coben versus Secretary Coben in, in a court system. So it would have been sort of odd to have that. And they've, they've done a good job of trying to split those types of things out so that they are not under the same secretary, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I want to come back to you for, before we switch gears. Or any final thoughts on DHHR and its reorganization, Mike? No, no, I'm, I'm satisfied with it. All right, let's uh, let's continue on then, and let's talk about the state budget, the final tax bill legislation the governor's expected to sign, and uh, whether or not you were uh, pleased or disappointed with the final tax cut agreement. You know, I don't know how you could be displeased with historic, you know, tax cut, largest in the state's history. Um, you know, as as conservatives, that's one of the things that we, we run on and try to accomplish. So I don't know how you can be disappointed. Um, is it everything you want? No. Um, but it is when you have three different organizations where the, the governor, the, the House, the Senate, trying to all get something that they want, <clears throat> there's going to be some give and take. And I think that's what happened here. Um, Obviously, the, the governor came out and said he wanted a 50% PIT um, reduction, and then you had the Senate said, no, we want, you know, some uh, personal property tax uh, reduction, car tax reduction, um, and then, you know, you sort of have to settle somewhere in the middle, and, and that's what happened. I think everybody's um, not extremely happy, but happy nonetheless that we have a, a, a product that uh, is good for the people of West Virginia. Matt Miller. Again, and, and I'm sure that most everybody is looking at it as, as just the beginning, right? You know, so let's, let's get this implemented. Let's then look ahead to next legislative session and see how things go from there. And, of course, there are trigger mechanisms as well, correct, as to how things may continue. Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the, the things that didn't come out of the House um, that I was was hoping for, so I was really happy to see them go in um, in the in the final Senate bill um, the trigger mechanisms that if we don't hit certain numbers and we don't hit certain triggers um, that there isn't the next step in reduction, um, which I think is important because you never know what the economy is going to do, you never know what severance is going to do. Um, so you have to be able to have some flexibility there. Um, so I was happy to see those, and uh, I, I think that'll be good for the overall plan. So again, uh, let's say that that next trigger that would kick in would kick in in another two years, but we don't quite reach the numbers in two years. But say in that third year out we do, would it then kick in at that point? That's correct, yes. Whenever we hit that trigger, that goal, whatever you want to call it, um, that's when the, the next step would, would kick in. And if we don't meet it, um, then it doesn't kick in. So it's sort of like a safeguard um, to make sure that, you know, 
the last thing any of us want to do is have to go back you know, in two years or four years or whatever and raise taxes um, to, to get back to where we need. So that's why these triggers are in place, is to make sure that we don't have to do that. Is there a mechanism in place, though, let's say in that third year we do hit that, that trigger, the, the, the move is made to advance to the next tax cut, but within a year or two after that, the numbers go back down. Is there a mechanism to cover that? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, part of the triggers is forward-looking as well. So um, I, I don't think that that would be an issue. Um, once you hit that trigger, it's going to stay there. Um, it would have to be something catastrophic at this point to go back. Matt Harvey. Delegate Hyde, you, you have five days left in your first session. Um, what, has, what have you learned going into your last week? Oh wow! Um, was it all? It was cracked? Was it? Was it what you was expecting? No, not at all. In in any way, was it what I was? I don't know what the heck I was expecting. <laughs> um, it it's been um, a trial by fire, if you will. Um, and I, not that I didn't enjoy my time down here, but trust me, I am looking forward to getting home um, and getting back to you know my old life per se. Um, I'm glad this is only 60 days. I have I have not worked this hard in a long, long time. So um, I'm looking forward to a little bit more relaxation. Um, but it's been good. Uh, we have learned a lot about how the system works, and and the give and take. I mean, that's the one thing you have to learn here is is how you know something that's important legislation to one individual means nothing to someone else. Um, and so you have to learn how to work your bills and what's important to you to get it across the finish line. And, you know, I had a bill that I worked and worked and worked in, in the House and finally got it out of the House and over in the Senate, and it, it looks like it might be dead in the Senate. I'm, I'm hoping not, but it, it's sort of buried in committee right now, and I don't know if it's going to get out. So. I'm still trying to work it and, and seeing what I can do to, to get it on the agenda, but um, it's not looking promising right now. Um, and to me, it was it was a great bill. The bill itself was, uh, we had talked about it on this show once before, um, that it was to make sure uh, credit bureaus weren't selling your financial information. And I'm thinking, you know, what what could be better than to prevent somebody from selling your financial information. And yet it's gotten stalled over there, I think by probably the Bankers Association or something like that, where they're the ones actually buying the, the information, so they don't want to see it go through. Um, so that's one of the things that I would like to see go through over there that I'm, I'm having trouble getting through. So I, I would say to the listeners out there, if you don't want your financial information <laughs> sold, uh, call Call the Senate uh, Banking and Insurance uh, uh, Chairman and, and tell him to put the bill on the agenda. I think if they're going to sell my information, they should at least be paying me a royalty for it. Don't you? Don't you think? Absolutely. Wow. I mean, how did, um, how did this get so out of hand and so accepted over the years? You know, that's a, I, it, it seems to me like that is, this is one of those things that has always been going on. We just didn't know about it. And, you know, when you start getting these calls from individuals trying to sell you insurance or, or mortgages or whatever, and you're wondering, you know, are these just cold calls? Well, no, they're not cold calls. Um, that anytime you go and fill out a credit application or a mortgage application, um, and then it gets sent off to the credit bureaus, they, they take all that information and put it in their database, and then they sell that every once in a while to, uh, you know, bankers and stuff that want to do uh, these, these massive calls or emails or, or uh, direct mail pieces or whatever. Um, now, I don't think they're selling your specific uh, credit score, but they could give a range. You know, they'll say it's between 650 and 700 or something like that, and then that that allows the banks and stuff to market and key in on you. So um, I'd like to see that stuff ended, and unless you want to opt in, and then that's you know your option to do that. Um, 
So, you know, like I say, I don't know why it's having so much trouble in the Senate. Let me just state that unless these bankers, these mortgage people, or these insurance people are sponsors of this show, I strongly disagree that they should be selling my information. Uh, you know, it's it's more targeted than that. I was talking to a, let's call him a political operative recently, who told me that he can buy from a cell phone provider the names or the numbers of people who are in, de- in attendance at certain rallies in certain locations. That's how specific now you can target this stuff. Just by where your ping from the cell phone tower was, they can, they can mark it to you directly based on what you just attended. Well, and there's other legislation um, that actually never got out of the House that sort of address those other types of information. Uh, they tried to, to combine the two bills together, but it never really happened, um, and they ran on their own. But uh, it was a good bill as well, um, but it never got out of the House. So there's, there's work down here to try to get those things um, corrected, but, you know, getting – Getting the House and the Senate, getting 134 people to, to agree is, is difficult sometimes. Hey, uh, Phil McCoy texted me and wanted to know if uh, the transfer uh, bill that was discussed for uh, kids in school, they can transfer a school, uh, if that has passed the House, if that will become law this year. Do you know? Um, yeah, so it was in, it, I think, I'm pretty sure it passed out of education yesterday. So it should be reported to the floor um, today. So there's a good chance that it makes it to the Senate. Well, I think it's a Senate bill. So, yeah, so there's a good chance it, it would get passed. Um, before the deadline. So um, I, I think it's going to make it. Hornby's on tomorrow, and he's on the Education Committee, so I'm sure we'll have the latest on that. I appreciate yeah. you drifting us in that direction. Final minute with Delegate Mike Height. Any final questions? Mr. Height, the final word is yours. Well, I, I just want to say uh, thanks to all the people that supported me back home. I am looking forward to getting back home and, and doing what I do. If you need some kind of legislation, if you think there's something wrong with the system, by all means, contact me. Uh, the best time to work on legislation is in the off season, so you get it in early in the session um, and you're not up against the wall the last minute like we are right now. So um, if, you, if you really want to see something changed uh, in, in law, uh, contact me uh, sometime in the off season. Very nice. Mike, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Thank have, you, guys. Have a good day. See you, Mike. You too.